All right. Um, thanks, everyone. Thanks so much uh, for being here. So complex activities often comprise using multiple different applications and moving back and forth between them uh, within your workflow. So for example, a graphic design task might include making a logo in Canva, editing that logo in Photoshop, um, bringing that into Adobe XD to make a mock-up, and finally putting it all together into a PowerPoint presentation. Um, and each of these apps has its own features, terminology, commands, and interface. Um, and while you might be an expert at some of them, you're probably a novice at others, especially as software changes over time and new software emerges. Um, so some applications are just complex. Um, for example, Photoshop. Tons of features, tons of commands, and it can take a long time to learn how to use them all. Um, but as you move between different apps, things you learn from one often don't map directly over to another. So for example, let's say I move into Sketch and I want to crop this image. Um, while Photoshop has a crop tool, Sketch does not. Um, the way to crop in Sketch is to use something called masking. Um, so if you're not familiar with that, it can be hard to, to go back and forth. Um, so one incredible resource for finding help with tasks like this is the web. Um, people search the web all the time and it's um, has you know, a ton of great resources to help you figure out your task. Um, but using the web to find help can be really hard, um, especially if you're a novice in the domain and you don't know the terminology, you don't know exactly what keywords to use in your search, um, and it can be hard to identify from a list of results what might be the best or most relevant resource for your particular task and situation. Um, now this is especially difficult when we're looking at video resources. Um, so if any of you were in the knowledge work section on Tuesday, there was a really great talk um, by Kimia Kiani um, on how people uh, search for help resources. And um, I had to put a slide in because it's just the perfect motivation for this talk. Um, and one of their key findings was that, you know, videos are one of the most popular resource people turn to for help, but they're also one of the hardest to use. Um, so videos, you know, it can be hard to identify from a list like this. Um, which where all you have is a thumbnail and a description, which video might be useful. Um, and you know, within any single video, it can be hard to find the actual moment that is relevant to what you need. Um, so great presentation. Um, so uh, within a single app, um, uh, contextual assistance can help alleviate some of these challenges by bringing um, all these online resources into the context of your own work. So for example, um, you could search in-app for resources or even based on a tool or element that you click on um, and automatically filter resources based on the name of the element so the user doesn't actually have to know what it's called. Similarly, um, uh, prior work has uh, shown you can augment web searches with relevant uh, context from your usage history, um, and then highlight uh, moments within you know, the resources and the documents you find that show parts that might be relevant to you. However, implementing assistance like this across applications can be really difficult. Um, today's applications are often walled gardens, meaning there's limited interaction between vendors um, and sometimes even within vendors. Um, so most prior work on contextual assistance has um, you know, implemented plugins um, that are baked into a particular application. Um, so how might we you know, take some of these benefits um, and bring contextual assistance to these workflows that span multiple different applications? So to address this, uh, we introduced Replay, which is an application-independent approach for contextually presenting video learning resources. Um, Replay is a, a panel we built that sits alongside whatever application you're using, um, makes it easy to search for video help, um, and in integrate it into your task in the context of what you're doing. Um, so it does this in three main ways. Uh, first, Replay helps users create better search queries um, by gathering context about what they're doing. Um, it helps, it finds relevant moments within videos um, to target uh, those parts that might be particularly useful to the user. And it presents these moments to the user in an easily navigable way so that they can integrate this stuff directly back into their own task. So for the first one, um, to help users create better search queries, Replay gathers context about what you're doing in whatever application you're using. Um, and what it does is it connect, uh, detects the name of the application you're in and also whatever tools or interface elements you click on. Um, so in this example, while I click around on these different buttons in Excel, um, Replay shows the name of the tool I've clicked on and also adds it to the search uh, field to kind of start you off with a, a query you could search for. And it also automatically adds the name of your application to any search that you, um, that you issue. 
So how do we do this? Um, how do we connect Replay with all these different kinds of desktop software? Um, for this, we use accessibility APIs. Um, so most uh, major operating systems have an API uh, you can use for accessibility. And it's really meant for application developers to make their apps accessible um, by labeling all the different interface elements so that things like screen readers um, can read what different buttons do. So we use this API to get that information about other applications. So whenever the user clicks on a tool or a button, um, Replay can get things like the type of element that was clicked, like a button, um, and some description of what it does, such as page layout. Um, and this, uh, using this API um, is a great way to kind of, you know, understand what is visible to the user in an application and gather some of this um, application-specific language and vocabulary across different applications. Um, but of course it has limitations. Um, not everything is always labeled. Um, and even, you know, when things are labeled, there's a multiple different um, values they might be listed under. Um, so Replay actually checks five different um, parameters, um, and we kind of just ranked these based on our own experience of what was most commonly labeled. Um, but even then, there's other things that accessibility APIs can't capture, like the semantic state of the application. So um, there are ongoing efforts, um, you know, in, in other research to kind of develop more standards or um, provide end user tagging so people can tag elements and it learns more over time. Um, but I think, you know, there's still lots to be done there as well. Um, so second, to find relevant moments in videos. Uh, first, we leverage an online existing video search engine, in this case YouTube, um, and we send the user's query off to there and get a list of videos back. Um, then what we do is we search the captions or subtitles for that video to find moments that match the user's query and also um, the names of the tools they've been clicking on um, so that we can uh, detect where it might be most relevant to them. Um, to get these captions, so YouTube automatically generates captions by default for most videos. Um, so there, most videos have these publicly available, um, but sadly there's no official API yet um, for actually getting them. Um, we found a bit of a roundabout way using this fun little undocumented API to get them, um, and it was an interesting process. So if you're more interested in that, I wrote a post about it that you can find on my Twitter um, that shows in detail how we did it. Um, but once we get these captions, they're all time stamped um, so we can identify these moments. And we also cache them on the user's local machine so they're faster to retrieve next time. Finally, uh, we present these moments we found to the user um, to make navigating to them easier. Um, and so uh, here what we show is we add these uh, overlays and these little markers on the timeline that identify moments that might be relevant. And when you hover over a marker, um, it shows a little excerpt from the captions at that moment. Um, and if you click on one, it'll play the video from that moment. Um, so uh, we highlight relevant matches with the user's query in green um, and matches with recent tools in gray. So. Uh, we wanted to understand how Replay compares to the current ways people search um, and find video help. Um, and the main thing we were interested in here is how and whether Replay changes people's search behavior, how they use the tool. Um, and one thing we were interested in was how long people spend in the search interface. Um, so our hypothesis here was that since Replay helps you find these moments um, faster than traditional video interfaces, it'll reduce the time people need to spend searching and browsing, thus allowing them to spend more time on the actual task they're working on. Um, secondly, more generally, we were just interested in how it changes people's um, searching and browsing strategies um, and, if, and if these are helpful. So we conducted a between-subject study where half our participants um, did a task where they could search for help on the web just on YouTube and a browser, and the other half used Replay. And in both conditions, we restricted the content people could search um, to just videos on YouTube so that it would be consistent. Um, the task we came up with crossed multiple applications to get at some of those benefits. Um, and it involved first uh, making some changes to a logo in Canva, then bringing that into Adobe XD and making some edits to a prototype, and finally putting them into a PowerPoint presentation. Um, so through this uh, mix of applications, we were able to get a mix of expertise levels amongst our participants too. So everyone in the study was very familiar with PowerPoint, um, but very few participants had used Canva or Adobe XD before. 
And as this task was kind of a mix of more creative requirements, like editing the logo, and more procedural requirements, like uh, changing aspects of the prototype, we weren't so interested in metrics like overall completion time or overall quality, um, because different people prioritize these things differently. Um, we were really interested in how me people make use of the search tool to find the help that they need while they're working on a task. Um, so to our first question, we did find that people who had the contextual assistance in replay spent less time searching. Um, so I'll mention that six people in our study didn't search at all, two in the, web, uh, two in the replay condition and four in the web condition. Um, and even among the others, people varied a lot in how often they searched for help. Um, so here we considered time spent per query. So on average, um, for each uh, query people made, for each search they did, um, the people in the replay condition spent about 40% time or about 30 seconds less in the search interface. Um, so for our first question, uh, the answer was yes, yay. Um, second question, uh, does replay change uh, more generally how people browse and navigate videos? Um, so for this, we turn to our qualitative observations, uh, interviews we did after the study, um, and also a, a field study we did with seven participants who used replay in the wild. Um, and we found it does change them in a, a few interesting ways. Um, and we think this is mainly why they made people so much faster at searching. Um, so I'll go over these two, um, these two things right now. So the first is the timeline markers. As you might expect, um, these markers helped people get to the information they needed more quickly rather than having to skim or skip through an entire video. Um, so eight of the 10 replay participants who searched for help made use of these markers. And here's an example from our actual study where someone was looking for how to record a video. Um, they searched and they used the timeline markers to find a moment right at the end of this 20 minute video where they showed how to record a video. Um, so in this case, they figured it out from that where they showed the button they needed. Um, and it's unlikely that they would have you know, made it through those 20 minutes otherwise. Uh, secondly, replay also lets people browse uh, multiple videos simultaneously. Um, so unlike traditional web interfaces where you have to choose a video, watch it, and then if you want to change, you have to go back to the results and kind of skip back and forth. Um, replay lets you um, look at multiple things at once. So in this example, um, the participant here started playing the second video, and while it was playing, they looked at the timeline markers on it, both the second video and then the first video, before deciding to watch the first video instead. So looking forward, um, there were a number of interesting questions that arose from this study, um, and I think you know, these will be some really interesting areas for future work, so I'll go over two of these questions now. Um, the first is around the context we gathered. So one thing we found was that um, searching based on the tools people clicked on actually wasn't very helpful for our participants. Um, as I mentioned, most of them were experienced in PowerPoint, and no one actually searched for help with PowerPoint. Um, so with Canva and XD, where people were searching, most of them were novices. Um, and they didn't maybe know which tools would be needed for their task because they were so new to the application. So instead, they tended to search for more action-oriented queries. So these are things like how to crop an image, how do I record a video, how do I round corners. They don't even know which tool might be useful for that task. Um, Tool level context may be more useful for people who have some experience in the application, um, can maybe make these links between tools and actions. Um, but for novices, it wasn't so helpful. So most people would just delete the tool and write their own query. Um, our current approach you know, is somewhat limited by the accessibility features we can get. Um, and for novices, this information was pretty low level. Um, so you know, now we're thinking about you know, how we might be able to interpret more higher level semantic information about what people are doing and also maybe looking more at what they're actually working on. So the document or the, the thing they have on their canvas, if there are properties of that that we can gather. Um, the second question um, is how can we help people when they don't know they need to search? So a lot of the participants in our study um, didn't actually, like I mentioned, six people didn't search for help at all. A lot of others didn't search as much as they could have. People didn't always know when they needed to search. Um, most of our participants tended to prefer exploring the interface and trying to figure it out themselves. Um, and this can be really helpful for learning um, and also just satisfying when you figure something out yourself. Um, and in general, people told us afterwards that they thought take, uh, searching would take too long, so they would just stick with what they were doing and hope they could figure it out. Um, but what this meant is that a lot of times people ended up using suboptimal methods and taking a more tedious route than they otherwise might have. Um, so in this example, one of the requirements we had was for everyone to replace 
um, the photos in this grid with a bunch of different photos. Um, and what most people did was they deleted the grid and then they very uh, painstakingly dragged in each image one at a time and resized and aligned them. Um, and this was painful to watch as the researcher. Um, <laughs> but what people didn't know and is actually shown in a lot of video tutorials for Adobe XD is that you can actually just select all the images, drag them into the first one, and then boom, um, it populates the whole thing. Um, so this, in this particular case, it's really an awareness or discovery problem. They weren't aware of this feature called the repeat grid that enables that. Um, but this kind of raises the question, you know, when might more proactive assistance be helpful and how can you implement that without being too disruptive to people? So can we encourage the exploration that they're doing but help make it more productive? Uh, so to wrap up, um, we introduced replay and application independent approach for finding uh, relevant clips in videos using context. Um, and we found that it did make searching and browsing faster um, and replace some of people's current video navigation strategies. Um, so with that, I want to thank, uh, thank all my collaborators um, and open it up for questions. Thank you. Hi, thanks for the talk, great tool. Uh, Kasha from Alta University. I was just wondering about your interface. So right now you have this kind of split pane where half the interface is occupied by the search. Did you also con consider like a tooltips kind of approach, maybe like tool clips? Yeah, I mean, that, was, that work was a big inspiration for this work for sure. Um, and we tried out, you know, a bunch of different interfaces. And I think it's, it's, it's hard to ride that boundary. Um, but even what we found, you know, what I mentioned as one of our results was that the tool level context wasn't so useful. And what we found also with an early prototype of a, a tool clips type version is that people often have questions that don't necessarily map to a specific tool. Um, so tool clips can be really helpful for like finding out what does this thing do. But if you want to know like how do I round the corners of this object, you wouldn't know where to mouse over for that. So that's why we kind of chose this always open view. But I think you know there's a whole design space of how you could implement something like this, um, and there's still lots to explore there. Thanks. Yeah, Susanne Ball, Oldenburg, thank you very much. Very nice. Um, I was wondering if this is, okay, I'm also like a member of the SIG Multimedia where more content analysis is done, where this is more on the user interface strategy. Just want to hear about your ideas on mixing user context for search in combination with maybe now the opportunity that deep neural networks offer where you can also have a deep insight into the content of the video. Did you try that or did you think about that? Yeah, um, no, I think th there's tons of stuff you can do, and we really, for, for this first implementation, we were like, what's the, what's the simplest way we can do it? Um, and so, uh, you know, video captions are a great way to find out what's in a video. Um, and what that also lets us do is kind of query them straight online and, and retrieve results right away. So, if, you know, if someone uploads a new video to YouTube today um, and I search for it on replay later, it'll be there. Um, but I think, you know, we, we've, we've also thought a lot about, you know, things like trying to understand more deeply what's in the video. And there's been a lot of great work on that, too, analyzing screencasts to figure out what people are doing. And I think that would really nicely complement this stuff. You could understand even what tools are being used in the video or what kinds of tasks are being done. Um, and that would help make these search results more relevant. Um, hi, my name is Serin from KAIST. So I really enjoyed your talk. So I think the reply mainly focused on the search part of the video, like creating the search query and finding relevant part of the video. So I'm interested in the later part of the search. So did you find, did you observe any um, people uh, find it hard to follow the video after they get a video to watch? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think, you know, for the, for the most part, people had pretty targeted questions, and so they would either find the moment they needed or they wouldn't. Um, and sometimes, you know, people would. They would click on the timeline markers, and then they would kind of be like, okay, this video seems like it has the answer. I'm going to go back to the beginning and watch more of it to get more context. Um, and so I think, you know, it's still, while you could just show little clips, it helped for people to have the whole video there so they could skip around. Um, but, yeah, that's, that's what we saw so far.
uh, Hai Chun from University, University of Toronto. So one thing that I um, like about like learning and sort of like software in general is, well, like the, the most of the softwares they are provided as tools, which I mean sort of inherently targeted as experts, right? Something that I want to do that I don't know, and then sort of like I have this intention, then I sort of need to know what tools can get me there. So I wonder, you know, this is, this is a great tool, a great invention for helping novice users, but I'm wondering if, if that application should be structured in several ways based on users' novices, uh, uh, sort of skills, right? Um, when you say, I'm just a novice user, I don't have any intention of like learning all the tools, but I just want to get it done. And most of the softwares nowadays, when they target at novice users, they just simplify the tools. They just like shrink into a smaller number of tools rather than think about what the novice user really wants. Mm -hmm. So I, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, there's, there's still, there's, there's a whole space of things you could explore for that. Um, I think, um, you know, in this case, uh, it was mostly used by novices and for experts, um, they tend to, you know, search for help less often, but I think you could do a lot of, you know, finding the right moments in the video depending on your own expertise as well. So if I'm an expert, I don't need to see the whole part where they set up the thing, I just need to see which tool they used at the end. But if I'm a novice and I'm at the beginning of the task, I might want to actually see how they get it set up and how they adjust certain parameters. Um, so I think, you know, there's also, if you could have some understanding of where these things happen in the video, um, you could do some more targeting based on that. Cool. Let's give another round of applause to Ailey.